All right, this whole video will focus on chapter 16, uh, which is about India and the Indian Ocean Basin in the post-classical era. So unlike China, India's default, so a little background, unlike China, India's default setting is political disunity. Why do you ask? Well, diversity of, well, anything, ethnicities, languages, geography, that makes it really hard to tie all together. However, India did have some cultural unity, especially with the caste system in Hinduism. So, a little recap, the last uh, major empire of classical India was the Gupta dynasty, which collapsed of, with the invasion of the White Huns from Central Asia beginning in 451 CE, like, leading to the, the state's collapse around uh, mi the mid-6th century. This leads in a chaos. This leads to chaos in northern India, with local powers vying vying against each other for power. Additionally, you have more invasions of Central Asian nomads, with the invasions of Islamic pre-Islamic Turkish nomads, who were later absorbed into Indian society. So we did have a temporary restoration of unified rule in North India by King Harsha, a picture of which we can see here. He was a Buddhist, well, a Buddhist by faith. Harsha was religiously tolerant. He was a generous supporter for the, of the poor and a patron of the arts. However, he gets assassinated. And in fact, he has no successor. Uh, this dynasty just simply just collapses. That dynasty, this, uh, this brief period of unification just falls apart in pieces. So... While this is all going on, you get the introduction of Islam to India. First, the military. The Arabs conquered the Indus River Valley, the slash Sin, around 7, 7, 11, 711. However, this area stood the fringe of the Islamic world. As a result, you got a very mixed population, a very religiously mixed population. So, you, so in reality, this story was only nominally held by the Abbasid dynasty to 1258, when they were when Baghdad was sat when their capital Baghdad was sacked by the Mongols. The, you also have merchants uh, spreading Islam. Muslim merchants took their faith to coastal regions of both northern and southern India. They, while there, they established local communities in all major cities of coastal India. This uh, port city penetration was a more gradual but no less effective uh, method than, than military conquest in terms of spreading Islam. You have also migrations and invasions for the, via the Khyber Pass. The Turks took advantage of the infighting between local rulers and annexed several northern states in northwest India. They plunder and destroy Hindu and Buddhist temples. Uh, one of their leaders, one of the most one of the most uh, infamous leaders who does this would be Muhammad of Gandhi. Uh, they often built and often built mosques atop the ruins. This gives Islam a bad name among the population. It also contributes to a further decline of Buddhism in the land of its birth. The next major like unification attempt would be the Sultanate of Delhi, which was a, cult, a consolidation of the Turkish raiding territory. It ruled northern India, De Delhi, from 12th to 6th century, century. It had a weak administrative structure, with a heavy reliance on cooperation of Hindu kings to carry out their the uh, Sultanate's policies and advance their interests in local regions. It was not exactly the most politically stable either, with 19 to 53 sultans getting assassinated. However, while they actually could live, the sultans prominently sponsored Islam and helped establish a secure place for their faith in the cultural landscape of India. And this is a, an example of the mosque they built, the Kutub Minar of Delhi. Sorry if I'm butchering that pronunciation. Uh, you also get uh, kingdoms develop, Hindu kingdoms developing in southern India, for example, Chola, reigning, lasting from 850 to 1267. It controlled Ceylon, and, aka Sri Lanka, and some parts of Southeast Asia for a while, and was trade-based. You also get Vijayan Nagar, reigning, which lasted from 1346 to 1565, and it was formed in opposition to Delhi Sultanate. All of this were weak politically, but they were strong culturally. So this is a map depicting uh, Ch the Chola territory. As you can see, it's not really you know it's a portion of southern India. However, we can also see that a large portion, and we can also see this big trade route uh, going through here. However, we can also see. Um, a lot of area, these green areas are actually influenced by the Chola Kingdom. And it, it now you may remember that Mons from a while back that Mons that uh, the monsoons are very important in terms of trade. Well, they're also important in terms of, in terms of agriculture by providing rainwater, which is important considering the fact that there are very few rivers in the, in southern India. Irrigation will later spread from north to 
would eventually later spread from northern India to South India, having leaving a major impact. And this all led to a huge population increase in urbanization. As we can see, we can see a massive population growth in India from 600 CE to 1500 CE, starting off um, starting at 50 million and 600 CE, and skyrocketing to a, to a little over 100 million in 1500 CE. Unsurprisingly, you uh, due to due to the fact that you know the world's very complex, there were lots of trade with with northern India as well as within southern India. For example, you got iron from the Ganges and pepper from the south. However, southern India's relative political stability, when compared to the north, actually helped enrich it. The local Hindu temples became economic and banking banking and social centers. Which is especially which is especially helped considering the choice they did not interfere with it that much anyway. So, Indian Ocean trade would eventually surge between the Abbasids and the Tang and Song empires. This was helped by the fact that the the, the, the sailors achieved mastery of the monsoons and and could chart blue water paths rather than just hooking the coast. You also got the advent of larger ships, helping the helping this uh, surge in trade. No, no, they were known as Daos and then Junks. The Arabs and the Persians would prove the most prominent sailors, with India and Emigal benefiting. You also got the establishment of an employer warehouse to store all your nice goods that you trade, traded, and products became more specialized. For example, development of cotton textiles and high carbon steel. Interestingly, uh, Christian Axiom in Ethiopia would actually be a key trader. Now that's interesting, considering the fact that we never actually know, we never learn much about, you know, the role African civilizations have in the world. But as we can see, they do play a major role. So this is a uh, simplified map, obviously, of the uh, trading world of the Indian Ocean, based on from 600 to 1600 CE. Um, you know, with, with, from April to September, the monsoon winds. Uh, go up north but then in november february the monsoon winds go south and so this can actually do a very predictable trading pattern we also got some uh nice trade routes going from coastal city to coastal city contributing contributing to actually contributing to trade you know all the way from Gang, all the way from china to the to these to the uh, cities along the coast of Af of eastern africa now with all the with the spread of Islam, you had well, now there were challenges to the uh, cat traditional castes and society of India with the growth of Islam, urbanization, economic development, and development of jatis or subcastes. They basically worked like workers' guilds. The caste system would expand from the north to the south, and it, but and it was dominant in by the eleventh century. This was promote the system was promoted by temples and the education system, and this caste system substituted for political unity. Uh, Buddhism becomes displaced as Muslim uh, as Muslim Turkish invasions destroy holy sites and temples. In 1196, Muslim forces destroy libraries and kill or exile and kill or exile thousands of monks. And as a result, Buddhism becomes a minor faith in the land of its birth. You you also get the rise of the devo devotional boot Hinduism with the growth of the de devotional cults, especially Vishnu the Preserver or Shiva the fertility of uh, the god of fertility and. The fertility and that's also the destroyer and we can see a uh, a um, little icon a little nice little icon of dancing shiva the cults promoted salvation and were more accessible they were especially popular in the southern india and spread to the north by 1500 you had 25 million islam muslim converts comprising a quarter of the total population of india they these convert these con, uh, people converted in the hopes of actually adva socially advancing from lower castes. However, this was rarely achieved as whole castes or jatis converted. Yet the social status remained constant. So whoops. So the most the most effective agents of Islam of converting others to Islam were Sufi mystics. They emphasized a personal emotional devotional devote. They emphasized personal emotional and devotional approaches to Islam rather than just fine points of doctrine. As a result, like with Hinduism and Islam, Hinduism and Islam both encouraged the cultivation of similar spiritual values that transcended the social and cultural boundary lines of post classical India. You get something called the Bhakti movement, a cult of love and devotion that ultimately sought to erase the distinction between Hinduism and Islam. It started in the 12th, cent 12th century in the south, eventually 
you mentioned spreading up north and encourage traditional piety and devotion. And it actually said that Allah and Shiva were just manifestations of the same universal deity. It did not succeed in harmonizing Hinduism and Islam, but it did serve as a nice little bridge. Indian influence in Southeast Asia dates from 500 BCE. The kingship with, you know, for example, you know, the kingship as the principal form of political authority coming from India, known as the Raja. You also get the you also get, you know, the uh, influence of Indian religions like Hinduism and or Buddhism. Literature also spreads promoting Hindu values and Buddhist values. These include the Ramahana and the Mahabharata. And however, the caste system was not as influential, and the in Southeast Asia continued to acknowledge the deities and nature spirits of their of their local cultures. In in a sense, religion was just basically just you. However, religion was used to legitimize monarchical rule. You also get Indian in, uh, uh, Indian Muslims being influenced by the 12th century. So one of the uh, early states of Southeast Asia was Hindu Funan. It, it started in the lower Mekong River from the first to si and ranged from the first to sixth century CE. It had an advanced irrigation system. It had advanced irrigation systems and was agriculturally based and it dominated the Isthmus of Kra. And use Sanskrit. There's also a Nevert's kingdom, the kingdom of Sh Suri Vijaya, uh, that was Buddhist. It was sent in Sumatra from 670 to 1025 and had a strong navy and trade. So, this is a map depicting some of the, ma some of the major Southeast Asian civilizations, for example, the Funan here and the Suri Vijaya here. Some later states of Southeast Asia include the Kingdom of Angkor, which started off Hindu but then became Buddhist. Starting, it started in Cambodia and it lasted from 889 to 1431 CE, and magnificent religious city complexes. You also get Singhasari and Majapahit. So this is a uh, map depicting these Southeast Asian civilizations, Angkor here, and si Singhasari and Majapahit here. You had early populations of Muslim traders in Southeast Asia in the 9th century. The ruling elites adopted Islam less as an exclusive and absolute creed than as a, rather, like, rather than a, as a faith that facilitated dealings with foreign Muslims that provided additional divine sanction for their rule. It became increasingly popular Sufi activity. Many would convert, yet retain some Hindu or Buddhist traditions. You are, the Malacca, it also helped the fact that that the, that the Malacca civilization cleared pirates and pushed Islam. And thanks for listening. I hope that hopefully that was. Helpful.